A Moroccan merchant sells a weapon to a goat herd who plans to use it to hunt down and kill jackals that are attacking his herd. He hands the gun over to his sons, who try pot shots at various items in the environment while herding to determine if the rifle can fire as far as the merchant said. Doubting that a bullet might reach, the younger of the two boys aims at a tour bus approximately three kilometers away and fires, without thinking about the consequences. The bus stops, and the boys stare at each other in fear. Amelia, a Mexican nanny, is looking after two American children. They are playing when the phone rings. The man on the other end of the line says his wife is feeling better and that they plan to operate. Someone is flying in to take care of the kids. He asks for his son, who tells him about school, then pauses and asks if he is okay. The nanny is nice and puts the kids to bed. The next morning, the guy phones again and says that the other person is not able to attend. The nanny must stay and care for the kids. The nanny explains that her son's wedding is that night and she really can't stay. The man is frustrated, tells her she must stay, and then hangs up. The nanny tries but cannot find anybody else to care for the kids, so she packs them up and drives them to Mexico with her nephew. Richard and Susan, an American couple, are sitting in a Moroccan cafe. She is agitated and doesn't want to be there. She accuses him of escaping. She is weeping and continues to cry while they ride a tour bus into the desert. She gets shot through the bus window and the bullet wounds her in the shoulder. Keiko, a deaf-mute Japanese teenager, loses her anger while playing volleyball at school and is ejected. The squad holds holds her responsible for their defeat. Her father wants to take her out to lunch after the game, but she prefers to hang out with her friends. He reminds her of her upcoming dental visit later that day. While playing a video game, some cute boys approach the girls and try to chat to them, but the girls can't hear and are unaware of their presence. Everyone is embarrassed when the boys learn the girls are deaf and the boys leave them alone. Kieko is very frustrated and when in the washroom with her friend, decides to take her panties off from under her short private school skirt. She flashes the guys when they return to their table. Boys herding the goats bring them home earlier than usual. When their father comes, he informs them that the route is closed. An American tourist was slain by a terrorist. The Mexican nephew, Amelia, and the kids have no trouble crossing the border into Mexico. They come just as everyone is ready for the wedding. The kids greet the groom and then go play with some Mexican kids. When they see a chicken being slaughtered for the wedding feast, they are taken aback. Richard and Susan are in a panic, unsure where to take Susan because the nearest hospital is four hours away. A clinic is 90 minutes away but the tour guide's village is close by, and there is a physician there. They decide to go to the village. The other passengers don't want to stay but Richard insists. He doesn't want to be left there with no means of transport. He calls the same person who was supposed to look after the kids so the nanny could go to the wedding, and has her call the embassy to arrange help. The village doctor comes. She determines that Susan's spine is fine, but her shoulder bone is shattered. She will bleed to death unless she is stitched up. We learn that he is a veterinarian when he sanitizes his needle with a lighter. Susan is stitched up without the need of anesthesia. Keiko goes to her dental appointment and keeps trying to lick the dentist. She then takes his hand in hers and places it on her crotch. She looks at him longingly and is clearly frustrated by her inability to communicate. He orders her to leave right now. When she gets home, she encounters two police officers who are looking for her father. They clarify that he is not in any danger, but they would want to speak with him. Alone in her apartment, Keiko flips through TV channels. We've learned that suspects in a Moroccan shooting have been arrested. Kieko's school friend arrives, and she informs her that one of the cop's young officers is hot. They go for the pantyless in the evening. The two Moroccan boys hide the gun. A brutal police officer discovers some shells on the slope where the bus had stopped. From the fresh goat droppings, he determines it must have been a local. They surround the house of the original gun seller, who is battered and informs the cops that he sold the gun to his neighbor, Aboum. When the police arrive, they question the boys whether they know where where Aboom lives. The youngest boy sends them in the wrong direction, and they run home to tell their father. The wedding is taking place in Mexico, and the American kids are having a great time. Everyone is dancing and going about their business. Amelia rekindles an old spark in her passions. Back in the Moroccan village, the tourists on the bus are hot and uncomfortable, and they want to leave. Susan is agitated and in discomfort. The tour guide's grandmother is helping care for her and brings out her opium pipe. Susan has three puffs and relaxes. The grandmother obviously 
obviously cares for her even though they can't communicate. Susan understands and has confidence in her. The Japanese girls meet up with some friends, including some guys who can sign, one of whom has whiskey and ecstasy-like pills. They all had a nice time and go to the disco. Keiko enjoys the lights and movement despite the fact that she cannot hear the music. Then she notices her best friend kissing the guy she likes. She storms out, but is irritated as she walks down the street, unable to hear anything. When she gets at her apartment, she requests that the doorman call the young police officer. She needs to speak with him. The police have returned to the gun salesman's farm, accusing him of fabricating the story about selling the gun. His wife shows them a photo of the tourist that gave him the gun, Kieko's father. They go retrieve the gun and try to flee, but the cops spot them strolling along the side of a hill. The cops pull their weapons and begin fire. The father and boys hide themselves behind some rocks. The elder son attempts to escape but is shot in the leg. The younger son takes up the firearm and shoots one of the cops in the shoulder. The wedding is coming to an end, and the nanny requests that her nephew drive her and the kids home. The groom is concerned that his nephew is inebriated, but he claims that he is not. At the U.S. border, they are harassed and made to pull over for secondary inspection. Instead, the nephew flees in the car and is pursued by two border police cars. He abandons the nanny and kids in the desert and escapes to avoid the cops. In the late afternoon, Richard and the tour guide talk as Susan sleeps. They share information about their kids. The police come and claim that an ambulance was supposed to be summoned, but that the American embassy canceled it. They were intending to send a helicopter, but there were complications. While he calls the embassy to figure out what's going on, the bus leaves. The young police officer arrives at Kieko's apartment. She shows him the balcony and tells him it's where she witnessed her mother jump to her death. Her cell phone flashes, and she returns inside. The cop admires the father's hunting trophies, and we see the identical photograph that the gun seller showed the Moroccan cops. The police officer explains that he is not there to investigate Kieko's mother's death, but rather a rifle registered to her father and that her father is not in trouble. He tries to leave, but Kieko stops him. She leaves the room and returns nude. She attempts to convince him to touch her, but he refuses and she cries. He comforts her as she cries. The older son attempts to escape again and is shot. The father runs to him while the younger son smashes the rifle. The son goes down to the police and admits to shooting the tour bus and the officer. He says his father and brother did nothing. The father is holding the lifeless body of his older brother. The morning after the wedding, the nanny and kids had slept in the desert. A border police car passes by but does not see them. The nanny wakes the kids up and they search for the car. She must carry the daughter but is unable to cover enough ground. She instructs the kids to wait in a shady area while she goes to look for help. She flags down a border police car after a lengthy walk through the desert. The agent arrests her despite her cries to help the kids. After some serious pleading, they return to the spot where she left the kids, but they are gone. A search is begun, with more patrol cars and a helicopter. Susan tells Richard that she peed her pants and has to go again. Richard borrows a pan and she uses it to pee in. They promise that they will never leave the kids again and kiss. We learn that another son of theirs died previously. He simply stopped breathing. This seems to have been the cause of their anxiety. We hear that the helicopter was held up because it was American and was not allowed into Moroccan airspace. It is now on its way. Kieko apologizes to the police officer and gives him a lengthy note. An immigration officer berates the nanny and says the kids could have died from her neglect. She is to be deported. She loves the kids, whom she has been caring for since infancy. There is no sign of her nephew. Richard has been notified in Morocco and is angry but will not press charges. She is picked up by her son at the border. The younger Moroccan son reminisces about playing with his brother as he is carried away. The helicopter arrives to pick up Susan. Richard tries to give the tour guide some money, but he refuses it. The helicopter takes Susan to a hospital, where press and suits film her arrival. The physician comes out and explains that there has been internal bleeding and she may lose her arm. Richard phones home and breaks down crying while hearing about his son's day at school. Keiko's father encounters the police officer leaving his building. The police officer asks him if he owned a 200 70 rifle that he gave to a Moroccan hunting guide. The father confirms that the guide was a good man, and he did give him the rifle. The father is concerned for the guide. The police officer tells him that he spoke with his daughter and is very sorry to hear about his wife jumping off the balcony. The father gets upset and tells him that she did not jump. She shot herself in the head, and the daughter was the first person to find her. The police officer says that the police won't be bothering them again, goes to a diner, and pulls out the note to read. We see on the diner's TV that Susan has has been discharged from a Casablanca hospital. Her ordeal is over. Kieko's father arrives home and sees the balcony door open, but no sign of the daughter. He finds her standing where she said her mother
father jumped from, the daughter takes him by the hand and breaks down crying. 